evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another evening of a breath of fresh air for patients and clinicians. Zephyr Valve and Pulmonics. Our guest this evening, Dr. Lisa Kopis, graduated summa cum laude from the M University of Texas at San Antonio. While raising a family, she attended Baylor College of Medicine, graduating in 2003. Dr. Kopis is board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary medicine, and critical care medicine, where her primary area of interest is advanced bronchoscopy. She is an avid international traveler who is planning to snorkel with the whale sharks in Mexico. Welcome to the show, Dr. Kopis. Thank you so much, Noah. I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. And our other guest is Ms. Cindy Dugas, who had her, her valves done in January 2017. She had three left upper lobe valves, and she is the chief admin of the Facebook group Lung Valves for Friends, which has over 3,300 members. Cindy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be All here. All right. So uh, <clears throat> without further ado, we will turn it over to Dr. Kopis. And ladies and gentlemen, you will have a chance to ask questions. You can type them into the Q&A. And uh, we'll see you on the other side. Thank you so much, Noah. So I'm going to um, share my screen. And, uh, you know, we're all Zoomers here, so this is the way of the world nowadays. But I'm really um, happy to be here, and um, I'm going to go ahead and do a little bit of a presentation. Hopefully, um, you know, it won't be too, we can stop, we can ask questions. Feel free if you want to put some questions in the chat. Um, I think Noah will be looking at the chat. And we can do those, you know, popcorn style throughout the show, or we can do those all at the end, either one, put them in however you want. So um, anyway, I'm Dr. Lisa Kopis, as Noah has um, so graciously introduced me. And I'm going to be talking to you today about a procedure that's near and dear to my heart, um, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. I should say it's near and dear to my lungs. But anyway, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. Um, and the title of this program is Changing the Paradigm for the Treatment of Severe Emphysema. I really like that title. The paradigm has been so long for emphysema in medicine treatment. And so, as you all know, who are out there, patients fighting this disease, you get an inhaler, you get another inhaler, you get a third inhaler, you get prednisone, you get a lot of different drugs. But now we know that we can actually treat this horrific disease with a procedure and some permanent al alteration to the lung anatomy. So we're gonna talk about what emphysema is. And that's a big question for some of my patients because they've been told for the longest time that they have COPD. And um, so it's really helpful to talk about what COPD is and what emphysema is and what the differences between the two are. We're also gonna talk about the treatment options for emphysema some of those you are very familiar with. And then we'll go into talking about bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. We will go into what the results of this procedure are, because that's really what we care about. And last but not least, I will tell you how to know if you or your loved one or your patient is a good candidate for this procedure. So COPD is kind of a catch-all phrase, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It can include emphysema, which we'll talk about in a second, and chronic bronchitis. And um, it's used actually all for other issues. So, you know, there's lots of people who have asthma who are told they have COPD. There's lots of people who have, um, you know, bron acute bronchitis, and they're told that they have COPD. So it's kind of a catchment for all different kinds of lung diseases. Here is the pulmonary disease that we are interested in. If you look at this picture here on the right, this is a really good uh, CT scan, actually. It's in, the, it's in the presentation like a chest x-ray would be, though, so it's probably a familiar picture to you guys. But here is what emphysema looks like. It's this absence of lung tissue in certain parts of the lung. It, is not reversible generally, um, and it causes airflow limitations. So when the air goes into the lungs, it cannot get back out, and that causes these air 
uh, areas here to become enlarged. There is an inflammatory response. This is early on in the disease. We see a lot of inflammation. There's also damage and um, essentially destruction of the alveolar, alveolar tissue. So here's what emphysema is compared to a healthy lung. This is a micrograph or a, uh, looking at the lung under a, a microscope. And you can see that the lung, essentially I tell people, it looks like a little sponge. It has little tiny air sacs. These are called alveoli. If you take each one of these air sacs and laid it flat on, um, on the ground, you have enough, air, normally you have enough lung tissue that it would cover the size of a tennis court. Okay, so that's where all the breathing is done. That's where the oxygen actually gets into the bloodstream, which feeds the rest of your body. As you can see here, a lot of those air sacs have been destroyed. So you have two alveoli next to each other. They are destroyed. They become one alveoli and so on and so on and so on. And what that does is it really cuts down on the amount of surface area. So instead of having a tennis court size to breathe with, you have something much smaller. What is realized on the patient side is breathlessness, okay? Starting out maybe when you um, need to move around and do a lot of exertion, and eventually you're short of breath all the time. So how did this all start? Well, of course, cigarette smoking is the main culprit. And, um, you know, we all, there were, uh, cigarettes have been very, very popular um, early on in the century. They were given to soldiers. So I, here in Houston, we have a very big veterans, um, veteran population. And so we have a lot of veterans who smoked a lot, a lot of everybody who smoked a lot. And as you can see in this ad, even doctors smoked camels, right? So it was kind of almost thought to be healthy. Let's talk about how people breathe. Um, this is a uh, normal looking diaphragm. And when, oops, let me go back, sorry guys. When, what is supposed to happen is when you inhale this dome shaped diaphragm will go down. And then as you exhale, it kind of comes back up and that pushes the air much like a bellows would work in and out of your lungs. As that's happening, your rib cage expands and contracts to do the same thing, inhalation and exhalation. The rib cage is working alongside the diaphragm in order to make the mechanics of ventilation actually work. So what happens when you have these destroyed emphysematous lungs? Well, over on this side, we have a cartoon picture of someone with emphysema and it pushes down the diaphragm, making it flat. Um, as you can see here, the lungs are much bigger. They take up a lot more room in the rib cage. So those two functions, the rib cage moving out and in, and the diaphragm moving up and down are greatly constricted. So what are the effects of hyperinflation in the disease of COPD? Well, let's many different things can happen. You have impaired wall movement, just as we just discussed, that rib cage is not able to go out and in as much. You have increased shortness of breath, decreased exercise performance, and in general, as many patients tell me, their quality of life goes down to almost zero. Um, eventually, you can have stress on the heart. And as this graph over here shows, you can have actually an increase in mortality when you look at how much air that's being trapped. So as you see here, this is someone with less air trapping, okay? And they're dying less frequently. This is a population of patients with more air trapping and they're dying quicker. And this is the disease progression. So you have the hyperinflation and the shortness of breath, which leads to decreased activity, leading to reduction in exercise capacity and further decrease in activity and further deconditioning. 
And it's this cycle over and over and over again. So the one thing that people who come in to see me for the first time know is I'm kind of a, a Nazi on the exercise. I want to stop this progression. And I know that your brain is telling you I can't breathe, stop moving. And so people get on the couch and then they further have breathlessness and they decrease their activity even more and more and eventually you lose all the muscle. And the muscle is really the compensatory mechanism for shortness of breath, okay? So your muscles have to compensate for what you can breathe in and out. And there's a high risk of mortality at the end there. So we're gonna talk about the treatments for emphysema. And typically we talk about this as a non-invasive versus invasive strategy. And I'm just gonna put everything on here. Um, before the Zephyr valve was um, placed on the market, we had medical management, which we talked about a little bit earlier. So it's the inhaler after inhaler after inhaler. We have pulmonary rehab. I am a huge fan of pulmonary rehab. Um, they should put a little plaque on our local pulmonary rehab center because I send so many patients there. I feel like exercise is really the way to, number one, get you to some of the more invasive treatments, and number two, be able to stall the amount of breathlessness that you have. Um, and then we have lung volume reduction surgery. In the early part of the 2000s and late 1990s, this was much studied, the, that you could actually take out the hyper expanded part of the lung through lung through um, resection and surgical resection and then be able to give room for the rest of the lung to expand and also to um, correct that problem that we have with the constriction of the diaphragm and chest wall and of course there is an ultimate treatment for emphysema and that would be lung transplantation obviously those things on the right hand side of the graph are much more invasive. The problem with lung volume reduction surgery is not that it doesn't work. It, it definitely works on the right patient. Um, it is that it has a more difficult recovery than some minimally invasive procedures. And it also has a higher mortality than some other options. The other problem with lung volume reduction surgery is um, there are not a whole lot of surgeons that do that procedure. You want a surgeon and this is, if you're looking for somebody to do lung valves, or are you looking for somebody to do lung volume reduction surgery, or are you looking for somebody to do lung transplantation? You want somebody who does a lot of them, right? If somebody does a lot of anything, they're gonna be very good at it. Um, and unfortunately, we just don't have a lot of surgeons who are uh, as well, um, who have a lot of volume and are who are willing to do this type of procedure. So what is lung bronchoscopic lung volume reduction? This is uh, an example of a Zephyr endobronchial valve. Um, they are tiny implantable devices. This is definitely not to scale. Um, the benefits uh, are similar with surgery. There is no cutting, the, no sutures that are needed. Um, you won't have a big gash in your chest, um, but it does require precise patient selection. And again, with surgery, there is the right patient for surgery if you have um, uh, adequate surgical center in your area. However, the Zephyr valve for most patients that, are, that would are seeking this kind of treatment is, um, should really be considered. It is proven in clinical trials. I won't go into a lot of that, but I'll show you a little bit of data on how well it works. And last but not least, it is fully removable if there are any problems. So the Zephyr valve would fit in the, me in the middle area here where it's more invasive than some of the medical treatments, but less invasive than some of the surgical treatments. Um, it's pretty new. It's only been out on the market a um, couple years. 
And though some of us who have been involved with the trials have been doing it much longer. All right. Uh, so here is a video. The Zephyr endobronchial valve is a proven minimally invasive treatment designed to improve breathing, activity, and quality of life for emphysema patients who are breathless despite maximum medical therapy. The Zephyr valve procedure is performed under general anesthesia or conscious sedation where a standard bronchoscope and flexible delivery catheter are used to guide the valves into the target lobe and desired airway. Multiple valves are implanted to ensure complete occlusion of all airways leading to the target lobe of the lung. Valves may be placed at the lobar, segmental, or subsegmental levels dependent on the airway anatomy. Trapped air in the treated lobe escapes through the Zephyr valves until the lung volume of the treated lobe is reduced. The valves can be removed and replaced if needed. After treatment, the remaining lobes can expand more fully and pressure on the diaphragm is relieved, improving breathing mechanics and overall lung function. Patients who respond to Zephyr valve treatment often experience meaningful improvement within 45 days. Okay, so that is um, a cartoon video on how it works. I think it's a really good video and I think there's a a version of this video online if you guys um, want to look at it again. The Zephyr. Oops, or I could just show it again. Let's see. Okay, so let's look at some of the clinical findings. So there were multiple trials that led up to the development and um, approval of the Zephyr valve. Um, so if you go back to some of the earlier trials, you'll notice they were shorter. They were six months running. And they also looked at a little bit of a different set of population. They were trying to find out which demographic group, which type of lung patient would benefit the most from the valve. And so when they got to the last trial prior to approval, the Liberate trial, um, they did that in a 12 month long fashion. So they did a randomization and what, what, I, what I would like to kind of try to re, um, relay simply is that in this trial, there were some people who got the valves and there were some people who didn't and that's called the control group. The control group did not, um, was, was randomized in a two to one fashion, meaning that the treatment group, there was two for every control patient in the group. That's what it says there, two to one. That's what that means. Um, we followed those patients up for 12 months. And when you look here, these are the results. So lung function improvement was about 18% in the treatment group, better than the control group. And exercise capacity, there was about a 39 meter improvement from the valve group to the control group. And quality of life, and this, this is a score where patients would answer the questionnaire and they would um, receive a score. The score that we have validated in this particular scoring system to mean anything, meaning the minimum clinical difference that is uh, necessary for people to feel better is m minus four. And in these patients, they had a minus seven, so that's quite significant. Dr. Kobus, can I ask what happens when you to the to the lung that gets blocked? So in the in the subsegment of the lung, and I'll just kind of let me see if I can go back here. Get a static picture. Okay, so in the lung, as you can see here, this upper lobe here is very large. And we can see that that's what we call hyperinflated. It's kind of like a balloon that's been blown up to too much. Um, and the reason for that is uh, the obstruction in the airways causes there to be trapping in those, both in the alveoli and just in the entire lobe itself. And so when you put the valves in to that lobe, the air can escape, but it can't be refilling itself. And so over time, 
and sometimes a pretty short amount of time, that giant lobe here is squished down to a small area. And so you can see this lobe increases and this lobe increases. And also the diaphragm can come back up to its um, normal shape. And this lobe just completely deflates of air, which is fine because it wasn't working anyway. So does the tissue remain alive or does the tissue die and just stay there? Right, so the tissue remains alive. There's no what would be called necrosis or necrotic tissue. Um, the blood vessels still are all going to that area of the lobe, lung. It's just that the air part has been compressed. The terminology for that is called atelectasis. And that just means that there's um, like the sponge is being squished. It's not, it's not fully open. So it no. sounds like the, 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 the non-working part of the lung is just being cleared so that the better working part of the lung has room to move. Is that it? Yes, no, absolutely. So this, we often find, and this is kind of a, um, I don't know if I'll have enough time to really explain it, but we often find that there's this concept of hetero heterogeneous um, emphysema, meaning that the lung down here looks pretty good, but the lung up here uh, does not look good and it is more affected by smoking. Sometimes it can be the upper lobe, sometimes it can be the lower lobe, sometimes you have more damage on the right side, sometimes you have more damage on the left side. And so we have processes in place through the use of, of special CAT scanning where we can actually target which lobe we want um, to put the valves in based on the amount of destruction in that particular lobe. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. All right, so I think this was the slide that we were on and um, this is a, a good visual uh, explanation on you know, the question that I always get is how, how good are they? How much improvement am I gonna find? So we can look at this in lung function scores. We can look at this in air trapping and we can look at this in um, quality of life scores or, or this is a score on how bad or good my, the COPD is. Um, this is six minute walk distance and, and other scoring systems here. And then this I'll explain in a minute. So first let's look at lung function. Um, you may not be uh, familiar with the term FEV1, but you can kind of think of it as how good my lungs are with my COPD. And there's two breakdowns here. One is groups of people in the trial that improve by greater than 15%. So that's the blue is treated patients and the yellow is not treated patients. And so you can see if you were treated, you were more likely to have a good improvement. And then this is just the same thing, but only with 12% improvement. <laughs> so you can see here greater than half of the patients who were treated improved 12% based on that FEV1 number. This is looking at the actual problem, which is air trapping. The RV is a good way to gauge that over time. And 61.6% uh, of patients met the goal for RV, which is, if you look down here, greater than a 310 ml improvement. And then again, this is a scoring system. Blue is better than yellow. That's what I can tell you about that. It's the simplest way to explain that. The patients that were treated with EBV did get better scores on this scoring system, as well as this scoring system and this scoring system. When you look at exercise capacity, we always measure that, um, at least in research terms, in the six minute walk distance. Many of the patients out there may have actually done six minute walks before, so you might be familiar with it. And in this particular um, graph, it's looking at the patients who had a greater than 25 meter improvement. And when you look at that, it's um, nearly, it's over double actually 
the patients that weren't treated. Um, and so then this graph here, which is only treated patients, shows you the amount of total lung volume reduction greater than 350 ml improvement and almost 85 percent of the patients treated met that goal. And this was at 12 months. So actually at six months, the numbers, um, you know, were a little better, but at 12 months, this is um, the cutoff that we got. So what's the actual effect of that? Because that's really what the patients want to know is how am I going to feel when I have these Zephyr valves in? And these are, we actually had patients do daily diaries once they got their valves placed um, or didn't. So this is the patients who did not have valves. And these are the patients, sorry, this is the patients who had valves. And these are the patients, the standard of care patients, meaning whatever their doctors were doing with them, they continued to do with them, but they just didn't have the valves. And in this case, that's talking about good days versus bad days. And so patients treated with Zephyr valves experienced significantly more days that were better than before the valve placement than were, ver were worse over the 12 month period. And what do patients say? They say they, they can breathe better. They can do more activities. They can do their household chores. They can go for walks. Um, returning to work for some of them may be possible. Uh, feeling more energy and confidence. And I really can't under, I can't overemphasize that confidence word. When I see patients with COP, they start making their world smaller. So we had that progression of the disease slide earlier, where we talked about the disease, making exercise harder, the disease progresses, they exercise less, and because you have less muscle, you can breathe, your breathlessness is worse, and it's just this cycle that goes on. And what happens in a, what happens in a real world sense is that you may stop going to the gym, you may stop walking the mall, you go to the grocery store and only get the cart. And then after a while, you don't wanna to go to the grocery store anymore. So you only go with your, you know, you only have your family members go. And then you know what, I'm not gonna leave my house. And then I'm not gonna leave my bedroom. And then, you know, it goes on and on like that. Putting these valves in, I think is a way to get your world back. You are able to do, go and do the things that you wanna do. Um, so what about safety? We, you know, absolutely do not wanna do anything that harms people. Um, uh, in, an, in a negligent way. So we have to look at that when we do any kind of procedure. There are adverse events with this procedure. We know that. I'm going to highlight a couple of them here. So the first one that I want to talk about is something called a pneumothorax. Um, a lot of times people come and they say, uh, and, the, and they confuse that, um, and there's a lot of terminology that goes around about it and they call it a collapsed lung. I, if you've been to my clinic, you know I don't like that term. Um, a pneumothorax is an actual um, defect or hole or puncture in the lung to where the air leaks out. It can heal. Um, most pneumothoraces, um, you know, do quite fine after treatment. Um, and, and as you can see, about 26% of patients who were treated did have that adverse event. So now, if just take a moment um, to go to Cindy for a second. So Cindy, sure. um, so can you identify with that world becoming smaller? How has your life changed since you've had the virus? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah, I totally agree with that. It was. I had a really small world. I just, I, I would have to be dropped off in front of the store or whatever, you know, because I couldn't walk that far. And uh, I actually don't go in the store right now, but it's only because of COVID, not anything else. But otherwise I would be going to pick out my own groceries. And, and I like Dr. Copas, I also like to travel. And I did do some traveling after I got my valves. So it was really wonderful to do that. Awesome. And you also coincidentally had a pneumothorax, right? 
I did. Could, could you did. tell us how, how was that for, I mean, I know it wasn't, you're not gonna be like, it was awesome. I had a pneumothorax, but <laughs> what was that experience like for you? Well, I didn't even know I had it until Dr. Copas told me I had it and I would have to go and get a tube in my lung. And so they whirled me off because they are really efficient there at the hospital. And um, in just a matter of minutes, I was getting that tube in. It was not painful at all. I felt a small amount of pressure. And really the worst part was just being confined to bed for 24 hours and then I was fine. Gotcha. Thank you so much. All right. Yes, Cindy uh, is a, definitely a trooper there. But uh, I would say that the, the, it is a similar experience with other patients who have this uh, adverse event. Um, the other thing I want to look at, though, is the number of COPD exacerbations that happen. So interestingly, um, in the period of time right after the procedure, so we're looking at 45 days out, you have 7.8% of COPD exacerbations compared to 4.8. So the number is somewhat higher in that, um, in that case. And also um, would be the same for respiratory failure, usually caused by COPD exacerbations. If you look at the number of these adverse events after the 45 days, so if you go all the way out to 12 months, for instance, um, the number reverses. So instead of having more COPD events, um, exacerbations in the treatment group, you actually have less in the treatment group and more in the non-treated group. So we know that the exacerbation rate after the initial post-operative period will go down. And then also the same for respiratory failure. You actually have a higher rate of respiratory failure in the group of patients that did not get the valves. And just to kind of go over the, and this is pneumothorax plural, pneumothoraces within three days of procedure are much higher than all the rest of the days in the post-operative period. So when you look at them, as you can see, this is graph, this bar graph represents number of people uh, uh, number of people with that adverse event of pneumothorax and as you go um, as you get further and further away from the procedure you can see that the event rate goes way down to where here you're having hardly any it can happen but they're rare and so um, in our center and, and is mandated certainly by the FDA we have patients stay in the hospital for three overnights and you can see not all of the, as Cindy was talking about getting a chest tube, um, there are some cases where we just observe. And then there are some rare cases where we actually do the chest tube and have to remove the valves. Interestingly enough, in some of those patients, we can put the valves back in and they don't have that same um, adverse event. So, how do I find out if I am a good candidate? Patient selection is enormously important. I always tell patients that this is a tool that we can use to be able to treat your emphysema, but you have to have the right kind of emphysema. It would be like saying um, you don't want to screw in a screw with a hammer. You want to be able to use the right tool for the right patient. It doesn't do anyone any service if I just put valves in everybody. You would just end up with, um, with not having the desired outcome. So my job, the hard part is not actually the procedure. The hard part for me is figuring out who's gonna benefit from this procedure. So um, we do a lot of things up front. We do clinical screening. That involves spirometry and pulmonary function testing of course, you have to have emphysema. You can't have chronic bronchitis or acute bronchitis or just shortness of breath from any other reason. It is only in patients with significant emphysema. You have to be medically stable. This is certainly a procedure. Cardiac fitness is pretty important with the type of anesthesia that we 
use and um, certainly can't have any other um, major medical issues that would um, get in the way of anesthesia. We then do what's called a Stratix analysis. This is a computer-based CT technology that will give us um, a visual and a numerical view of the lungs. And so we can pick out the right target. And then also the last but not least, and I always have to remind patients as we go through all of the time consuming um, process of the preoperative analysis and um, evaluation, I always remind them at the end, remember, just because you have a procedure date, um, I still have to do this one last test and that's called the Chartist assessment. It actually tells me um, if there is a complete fissure and collateral ventilation, and I will tell you what that is in a second. And then finally, we give you an, a procedure date and we do the treatment. Can you say the right target? Does one valve collapse an entire lobe? So usually, um, I've used as few as three, like I did with Cindy, and I've used as many as seven. And so it really is, um, the anatomy is very different on different people. And so we go in and we size the airways and we make sure that we're putting the right valve size in each airway. And sometimes I'll put in one and sometimes I'll put in two in each subsegment. It's very different on each person. And do you ever do, you ever do um, both sides at once or is that only single lung at a time? Only a single lung, that's what's um, uh, approved by the FDA. So we find that we get a, if we can get a considerable lung volume reduction, like it was demonstrated in some of the graphs before, we get a great effect. And that usually translates to such as what Cindy was talking about. She's able to, you know, go out to the grocery store, go to the mall, go traveling where you couldn't before. So, and then I have, um, which we have kind of a system at our center, um, and I'm, I just put it up here as the COPUS criteria. Not every center may put as much emphasis on this, but again, I, um, I'm a big um, proponent of trying to do everything on the patient side before we get to the procedure so that you have the absolute optimum um, effect. So of course we do pulmonary function testing and there is criteria for that. We only wanna put valves in patients who have hyperinflation. And so there's a certain number that we target. We do a six minute walk test and this is ex very important in my clinic. We have a target of, what, of how much I need you to walk. And sometimes patients come in and they think, oh, Maybe she only puts the valves in patients who are really, really, really unable to walk and can't breathe and, you know, the worst of the worst. And that's actually not the concept of these valves. We actually want patients who still have muscular conditioning so that when we put the valve in, they're able to start exercising and doing things right away. I usually tell patients, you know, I can put all the gas in my car, but if the engine doesn't work, it doesn't do any good. And so that's the analogy that I use. These valves are like putting gasoline in the car, but you need your engine to work. With and, BMI, and is there ever a point, I'm sorry, is, is there ahead. ever a point where it's too late, where it's like stage three or stage four, and you say you're, you're disqualified from the valve? So what I will tell patients is to go back to pulmonary rehab. If, it, if the six minute walk is the only thing that's holding them back, mm -hmm. I will ask you know, if they're kind of um, borderline type patients or not quite meeting a good six minute walk. A lot of times it's just because they haven't been trying to exercise. I have patients come back to me um, once they've done a full set of pulmonary rehab and say, wow, I wish I would have done that, you know, two years ago, four years ago, because they've never been through pulmonary rehab before. And I mean, it's just amazing. You can get, you know, a good effect um, sometimes just by doing the pulmonary rehab alone. A lot of times if patients don't qualify based on the CT scan or their PFTs, I still send them to pulmonary rehab because I know that their breathlessness is in part due to deconditioning. 
So I also pay attention to the BMI. So there's two problems with COPD patients. They are either, um, you know, very catabolic. That's a fancy science word that means that they are basically at such a high metabolism rate just to stay breathing um, because their lungs aren't working very well that they tend to get skinnier. And, um, and so sometimes we have to really work with their nutritional um, their nutritional content to give them the optimum protein so that they can gain a little bit of weight before the procedure. Um, and on the other side, we have some patients who, because they're not able to exercise, really start putting on weight. And I generally want them to lose some weight by either diet or increase in their exercise. So we'll put them on that kind of program in preparation for their procedure. We do have some CT issues. Sometimes you find nodules. These are former smokers by and large. And so there's sometimes nodules that we have to deal with. And sometimes they have really bad bilateral disease. And as Noah was talking about, we only put the valves in one side. So there's sometimes extra analysis that has to be done with certain types of scanning so that I can decide which side would be the best to do. Some patients require ABGs um, in order to get on a better um, form of nocturnal ventilation. Sometimes patients need that or they need ABGs to identify other problems like in patients with pulmonary hypertension. Um, and then there's always the heart we have to deal with, you know, especially for anesthesia, we have to make sure that you have a fit heart. And so sometimes that involves some testing there. So let's talk about collateral ventilation. I've thrown around that term a couple of times. Collateral ventilation is this quirky thing where, um, well, first of all, the, the lung is like an orange. It is segmented, okay? And so like an orange, it has that thin little lining around each of the little subsegments. And so each of your lobes should have a thin lining around it, okay? Most of the time, the lining is completely fully goes going between the two lobes, meaning there's no communication, there's no tunnels, and there's no airflow between lobes. But in some patients, a minority of patients, they will have some airflow that kind of leaks through what I call a tunnel, um, but leaks through this, this missing part of the fissure um, or lining of this lobe. That's called collateral ventilation. So what's the problem with collateral ventilation? Well, if I put a valve on this patient with the collateral ventilation, I would usually put it right here. This is the only place I could put it for that particular area. If I put it here and air can go out but not back in, that's the way the valve works. But what if air starts leaking in this way? And so that the area of this lobe never completely deflates or becomes atelectatic. It just continues to be open. So what collateral ventilation really means is that the valves just aren't going to work. Okay, so what we're trying to find are patients with no collateral ventilation so that we can totally deflate or reduce the volume of this lobe. So here's a kind of schematic. This is the way we do things um, in the procedure. You do get anesthesia. Most patients are really happy to hear that. And so you will be completely asleep throughout the procedure. Then the bronchoscope, which is basically a small tube with a camera, will be inserted into your lungs. We will put in the valves. Um, so like we were talking about earlier, sometimes it takes three valves. And like in Cindy's case, sometimes I've put in as many as seven. And we will stay in the hospital for three nights, mainly to watch for the pneumothorax. And then after the procedure, you will go back to the medications that you've been using. Please do not stop the medications. They are very useful. And you will go eventually back to your exercise. I usually have a short period of rest so that the valves can get fully seated, but then right back to doing your normal exercise. The procedure does last about 60 minutes. There is this Chartis test. And so I do tell patients, I remind them that there is a, um, a possibility based on the collateral ventilation system 
um, or collateral ventilation situation that you could actually um, be woken up from the procedure and no valves are placed and you would go home. If you do get valves, you'll stay in the hospital for three nights. Uh, again, part of my, um, my uh, uh, rule is that for the first 48 hours, you are on bed rest. And then once you are discharged, we want you back in pulmonary re rehab at least at two weeks. For the first six weeks, it's what I tell my patients is, I want you to tell me all of the problems that go on. Even if you have a primary pulmonologist and you have a, a COPD exacerbation, all of that needs to be dealt with by me, but at six weeks, as long as you're doing fine, we would release you back to the treating doctor. Besides making the patient feel better, do you think that pulmonary rehab makes any difference in the outcome of the, like for example, with lung function? Yeah, I think it really does. I think that you can definitely have better mechanics because a part of the, the muscular system that they're working on is exactly what we talked about earlier in the program where you have, you have tons of small muscles um, between your ribs that have to expand for, um, for lung ventilation. Also what I call the cape muscles, which are the muscles of the shoulder, your pecs, um, um, even biceps and muscles in your back all work to lift your chest open so that you can have better um, ventilation mechanics. And I think that that will also result in better lung function. Glad to hear you say that. I, I think so too. Mm -hmm. um, so in the Zephyr stair step here, we want to, we want to definitely, uh, you know, the, the procedure has to be successful. So there's a couple of different ways that we can tell if that has happened. On PFTs, you would have improved lung function and reduced gas trapping. But what the patients tell me is I can breathe easier. I have less breathlessness. I have improved quality of life. Everyone talks about exercise and in general, improved health status. So what to expect from the Zephyr um, valve treatment. Um, patients, uh, the effect size here, uh, many different ways to score this. Uh, you have less dyspnea, which is another word for shortness of breath, more activity. And then even on the um, psychosocial, you just feel better. And so um, they experience, here it says they experience moderate to large improvements in all of these parameters out to at least 12 months. Does it last more than 12 months? Well, Cindy can probably answer that question. Um, what do you think, Cindy? Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's and, been almost four years for me, so yeah. All right, very good. Cindy was my very first patient that I implanted. Really? Okay. So find a treatment, treatment center in your area. Make sure that they are experienced in what they do. And um, you can go on mylungsmylife.com to find that. You can also go on uh, my website, which is www.houstonlungdocs.com. If you're in the Houston area, we'd be happy to see you and talk about uh, valves. We do uh, video visits just like this. I feel like I stare at a computer all the time now. Um, but if you want to call my office, we are very, very busy. But if you say, I need a valve, um, they will get you in much quicker, and that's my address. That's the code word right there. That's I need the a valve. Word. I need a valve. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna. All right. I do have Cindy a couple of slides on Cindy that I wanted to kind of just give some clinical information before she, or either before or after she tells her story. So yeah. So um, why don't why don't you give the slides and then we'll go to Cindy for a, a little tale and then we'll go to the speed round. All right. Questions. So Cindy, before um, she had daily symptoms, she had stopped traveling, she stopped gardening, she had trouble with stairs, and she told me she had about two exacerbations in the last year prior to me meeting her. We saw on her pulmonary function test hyperinflation and poor lung function. She walked about, there was a couple of different six minute walks prior to her getting into, um, getting her procedure, but she did about 231 meters in six minutes. And 
maintenance, she was a very good exercise patient. That's what I can tell you. She was great with pulmonary rehab and she did treadmill 30 minutes a day and arm curls and some other exercises as well. She had a great BMI. <clears throat> she had no CT issues. So I'm running down the COPUS criteria here. Her ABG was normal and her EKG was normal. So we had no trouble putting her into the program. And I'll let her tell you what happened um, and, and fill in the, the gaps. But essentially she had an 820 mil difference in her RV. So decreased by 22%. She had a significant improvement in her FEV1 at 30%, which is a great improvement. And she could walk more. So her 231 meters became 200, 350. And um, she had a decrease in her exacerbation rate. I think we've maybe had two or three, maybe two exacerbations since the procedure. And like she said, that was four years ago. So I'm gonna stop sharing and we can talk with Cindy. All right, Cindy, so, so give us some scoop. What, what do you wanna tell people who are thinking about getting the valves? At least check it out to see if you can get them because you owe it to yourself to do that. Um, you know, it, it, you may not be a good candidate if you aren't, but um, it's you. You just owe it to yourself to to get a better quality of life and just do it. And what would you say is the the best, the greatest benefit you personally have had since since getting the valves? Uh, well, it's just all over because. Um, I'm happier for one thing because I'm not just sitting here waiting to die, you know. I'm well, that's doing a plus, things. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a big plus. That's a big plus. Um, you know, not every day is easy. I mean, I have hard days too, but um, I can. I every day I try. You know, I try as much as I can to 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 be as normal as I can be. So. And, and for the people in the group that worry that they, they're always going to think of the, what, what was the most challenging part of it, of it that you obviously you've come through it in great shape. But if you had to say what was the most challenging aspect of, of the valve procedure. Well, I was in the, I was in the trial. And so I was in the control group, you know, and then I go and I'm like randomized. So I've got to go through. So it was waiting for me. You know, I mean, I knew that I qualified in every way, but since I was randomized, I had to go through the whole thing again. So it was waiting. That was the hardest part. And, and trying to stay well during that time, because I knew that if I got sick with another exacerbation, it would set me back. So I put a lot of effort into staying well. Mm, she did. Awesome. And I'm sure that's the 90% of the key to your success. Um, thank you so much for being here, Cindy. And I also just want to, you know, really give you kudos for the encouragement that you give to so many other people in your group. It's a super upbeat group. And some of the COPD groups you go on, it's just like, oh, this is so bad. This is so mm -hmm. terrible. And, and you run a very positive group. And I have a lot of respect for that. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, Dr. Kopis, so we're gonna to go to the speed round. So how much would you like to wager on each question? Uh, how much would I like to wager? Well, I don't usually, I'm not a gambler. You're not a gambler, like, okay. Yeah, we'll like we'll up. answer for you. We'll say you're all in. How many, do you know how many patients have been treated worldwide? I don't, actually. All that right, would good answer. How many have you done? How many have you done? So, uh, We've, we're at about the 30 patient mark for me, and I think we're at about 50 for my group. That's awesome. Okay. Um, I know you mentioned uh, quality of life, better recovery. Are there other reasons to choose a Zephyr valve over surgery? Yes. So the immediate post-procedure time period is a lot rougher with surgery. Um, it, you know, you just, you... Um, the amount of time in the hospital is longer. The amount of time you're not exercising is longer. Um, you can have other types of um, adverse events a lot more than what you would have with valves. Again, not everybody 
can be a valve patient, especially again, like we talked about, the collateral ventilation issue might knock you over into having surgery. But I think that you should be evaluated for valves first. And then if you are not a good candidate, we can see if surgery might work for you. And here's a, a question of, of my own um, that I, I never asked this before, but I just thought of it tonight. So um, I know for some procedures, like let's say a lung transplant, like you don't mm -hmm. want to go too early, right? Because there's a time limit. Can you go too early for this or is it kind of the sooner the better? Uh, there is a sweet spot. Okay. okay. So we want the patient um, far enough down the line so that they get some benefit, right? So the main number is the hyperinflation. Hyperinflation to the degree that would be helped by this device is usually not found in mild COPD, for instance. So you're usually talking the patients who have already <laughs> been put on all the inhalers. A lot of them are on oxygen, so it's definitely not a contraindication. Um, you know, I'd say most of my patients are already to the oxygen stage. There are some patients who I have found that are very fit, like Cindy actually, who maybe didn't need a lot of oxygen pre-procedure. And that's mainly because they're compensating so well. And we get a lot of questions about oxygen. So do most people come off oxygen after the procedure? That's a really good question. Um, it certainly wasn't answered in the trial. Um, that's not one of the outcomes. So statistically, we can't comment on, yes, you have a X percentage of chance of getting off oxygen. I think some people with the combination of um, the pulmonary rehab, the maintenance programs, staying on your medication and the valves could at least lessen their dependence on oxygen. Gotcha. Okay, this question is not from me. It says I'm an 84 year old female COPD patient. My situation is complicated by pectus excavatum. Would this interfere with my receiving the valves? Yeah, so we'd have to look at the, um, that's a great question actually. I've never had a patient who came to me to be evaluated with that specific situation. We would need to look at the pulmonary function um, test because usually pectus causes a restriction and it doesn't allow for as much hyperinflation. And so we just have to figure out if you had a lobe. Um, it would be a case where I might, if you were borderline on the PFT, I would go ahead and do your stratix because the situation may be that the restriction is hiding some of the hyperinflation that you may have in a single lobe. And so I would want to maybe do the Stratix anyway, just to see if there was a target. It would be a complicated yet interesting case. Yeah, very interesting point. Um, can you have this done if you have both end stage COPD and squamous cell lung cancer? I've had no radiation and no chemo. That is another really good question. I would follow up by asking um, the oncologist what the life expectancy is, and if he's had no chemo and no radiation, then what are they doing to treat the cancer? Because um, that's obviously the bigger problem. I did have a patient who um, is in the process of being evaluated. He has had treatment for his lung cancer. It's worked, as far as we know. Um, and and the, he would like to be um, so there's really no contraindication to that specific situation. And his oncologist is all on board because he wants to, if he end up, ends up needing more treatment somewhere down the line, he wants him to have as much lung function as possible, so. Is there an age limit? Like do people over 76 do very well? Asking for a friend. There is no 76 age limit. Um, we would take each person based on their physiologic age, which has a lot to do with how far you can walk and, and other things. Awesome. Do most insurances cover this procedure? So part of that depends on where you live. Um, I think in general, it is well covered. Uh, certainly straight Medicare covers it without even a prior authorization. The rest of the um, Medicare Advantage and Medicare supplement plans and private insurance would generally require a case-by-case -case prior authorization. We have 
not had a lot of a lot of problem. I would say maybe one patient that's come to see me was just denied outright. The rest were able to be approved. How do I find a treating center near me? Well, and I believe that is mylungsmylife.com, correct? That's exactly right. That is exactly right. Okay. And if you do have any trouble with that, please feel free to contact Pulmonics and we can help you uh, find a place as well. Um, what if I have AFib and a rare autoimmune disease? So I'm not sure about the rare autoimmune disease. I don't think unless it had some other um, anesthesia risks particular to it. The AFib really would be the thing that we'd have to make sure is well controlled. I have done patients with active AFib and, um, and putting these valves in, but they had to be well controlled on medication. The other thing gotcha. with AFib is we have to make sure that you understand that we would have to stop anticoagulation. Of course, with AFib, you are at some increased risk of stroke if you're not on your anticoagulant. So we'd have to kind of weigh those. Um, can you fly if you have the valves? Yes, just not in the first few weeks. Okay, what are the symptoms of a pneumothorax? Generally chest pain and shortness of breath. And I kind of hammer that into my patients as they're going into the hospital setting. Um, there's never an hour where you should not tell your nurse that you have chest pain or shortness of breath. The shortness of breath is actually harder for the patients because they're so used to having shortness of breath all the time. And so I tell them, look, a chest x-ray is cheap. Just tell them what you have. You're short of breath, a little bit of short of breath. We'll get you a chest x-ray and figure it out. And are procedures going on now with COVID? They are at my center. We work really hard. Um, Methodist Hospital is um, phenomenal at uh, keeping the surgeries and procedures going even during this time in COVID. They have made it so that the, the, so there's two problems with doing procedures in COVID. Number one is scarcity of ICU beds. And so if um, our, our center, we are um, just so lucky to have so many ICU beds they even built more in order to keep the elective surgeries going. And so we have not had that restriction. I know some centers, because they have limited resources, um, are not able to do the procedures right now. Secondly, there's the problem with COVID and the risk of exposure. And so for a while, we weren't doing bronchoscopies at all because it is a high exposure um, with the aerosolization of secretions and so forth that has to happen when you do intubation, which is what happens during any procedure. So what we've done is you have to get tested. We have special PPE that we wear that's above and beyond. And we have a special procedure during the time of intubation. Everyone but the anesthesiologist is right outside of the room. Okay, so I'm going to go to a couple of just simply yes, no, maybe so's. I was evaluated several years ago, and because I'm allergic to nickel, I was not a candidate. I was told the valves are nickel and titanium. Am I a candidate? Yes, no, maybe so. Uh, no. Not a candidate, allergic to nickel. Okay. Had heart surgery, mitral tricuspid 11 years ago, bypass five years ago. 77 year old male, walk three minutes, walk minimum three times a week. 2.5 to 3.5 miles. Does the heart history disqualify me? It doesn't disqualify you. We'd have to have a conversation with your cardiologist and see, and really discuss the anesthesia and also some of the post-operative um, stress on the heart that may happen with the new one. has to be evaluated individually though. Absolutely. Okay, what if I have two mechanical heart valves and I'm on Coumadin? Yes. Same thing? Uh, same thing, we can do kind of a uh, IV um, anticoagulant bridge um, or, or, you know, like the, the Lovenox shots, we can do those in order to minimize the time that you're off. Um, it, again, it does require um, a little bit of discussion with your cardiologist, um, but it's just like any other procedure, you have to bridge those valves, you can't leave them un, un 
anticoagulated. What if I have three mechanical valves and an addiction to Mentos? No, I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Very informative. Keeping my fingers crossed that I qualify. Um, what else do we have here? Is there an alternate sedation to anesthesia? Does everyone have to be an oh, So I, uh, I really prefer to do anesthesia, uh, general anesthesia only cases. There's a couple reasons for that. Um, it's a shorter procedure. And so that's always better for the patient. Again, um, there's a, there's a trade-off between having the patient under moderate sedation for longer and having general sedation for a shorter procedure. Also, I think the effect is better because under moderate sedation, patients cough. Um, during the, Cindy, half of her procedure was under moderate sedation because that's how the trial was set up. And um, it was a very, very difficult, um, uh, technically difficult procedure that way. Now it's a walk in the park. Okay, two more. I am a happy Zephyr patient as of last week, 92220. I feel great other than I see my oxygen is a little crazy lately. I was not on O2 before and am not now. Is it normal for about a week in to still be short of breath and O2 to drop and bounce up? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of inflammation going on there. Your lungs moving around. Um, without getting too pathophys on you, the uh, when you shut down one part of the lung and open up another part, there's this whole thing where the blood vessels shunt blood differentially. And so all of that's happening. It's going to be crazy for a few weeks. And I keep hanging and, and Pamela, to get a little Brooklyn on you, you didn't get in this hole in one week. You ain't getting out <laughs> in one week, okay? Uh, hang in there. My lung specialist said I'm an excellent candidate for pulmonary rehab, but with COVID in the picture, all places are closed. Yes. Should I do pulmonary rehab in, in, in order to consider this procedure? Yeah, so there, um, I don't know. You might want to Google. Um, wait, wait, no need to Google. Wait a second. The Pulmonary Wellness Foundation has an online boot camp, 42 day online boot camp, www.pulmonarywellness.org. Dr. Kopis, final words. Yeah, I just really encourage um, anyone who's out there. Um, to come and be evaluated. And if this is the hammer for your nail, let's get at it.